name's Mark. Um, I'm from uh, Zero Emissions Noosa, which is a, a local community group that really advocates towards um, electrification. Um, obviously, we've, we've run this expo for a number of years and it's really been focused on electric vehicles. But for this year, we've broadened it. And uh, it's not just electric vehicles. We're also looking at things like household electrification. And one of the projects that I'm running for Zero Emissions Noosa is called Rewiring Noosa. And I've electrified my own house, uh, Max electrified his cooking, and we're really trying to help um, Noosa households electrify. So what we're going to do today, um, we're, we're very pleased to have Matt Galinsky um, support us in this initiative, and we're going to talk about something else around electrification, and that's what, 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 it, what it looks like in your kitchen. And uh, the format for today, we're going to have about half an hour here in the kitchen with Matt, and he's going to show us some, uh, some, some great stuff. Um, and uh, certainly feel free to ask questions and be interactive with Matt around the cooking. And then what we'll do is we'll then go out into the dining room and uh, I'll have about 15 minutes with you and we'll talk a little bit about electrification. If you've got any questions, either about the kitchen or, or other things around electrifying your household, I'm certainly happy, happy to help. So with that, over, over to you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, so the first thing we're going to do as an experiment is I've just put a pot of water over there, three litres of water, cold water, on the stove with gas, three litres of water in here. And last time we managed to pretty much cook the whole dish and that still hadn't boiled. So it's just a good example of the difference between induction and gas and what that, how that works. So um, to start off with, I'm a chef who's always worked with gas, always hated induction. You know, it was you know, it annoys the hell out of me. I've been, I've, I've catered all around Noosa for years at people's houses where I go into their house and cook for them, and they walk in and they've got induction. It's like, okay, I need a degree on how to actually press all the buttons and make it work and everything else. Um, and so, and the thing about using gas is, you turn it on, you can see it. It's hot up full. It's on. It's pouring out. If it's on low, then you can see that it's a low flame. So it's from a a visual point of view, it seems easier to use from that point of view, but I've recently, um, since moving out to Kinkin, so I've moved out to 14 acres in Kinkin, um, and the first thing I did was put on solar and a battery. And now we're at a point where we've got this terrible old house, farmhouse that we live in, that used to be a restaurant in the 80s, and, uh, and it looks like it was as well. <laughs> um, and so just about reaching the point of renovating the kitchen um, got the cabinet makers out and they've you know and I've had this Gilby gas stove that I bought second hand for sitting in the shed for about 12 months and I'm like yeah that's the stove I'm going to put in and then after doing this and getting doing some research um, it just I suddenly went what am I doing putting a gas stove in when it would make way more sense for me having my own free electricity to have a stove that uses electricity instead of burning gas. Um, and there's a lot of other things we'll talk about. You know, there's things like the cleaning elements of having having a gas stove. You can pull all the burners off, and you can pull all the things off, and everything else. You wipe an uh, induction stove, and it's wiped clean. There's also that that never really occurred to me greatly before was the fact that you're actually burning gas in your house as well. Which is not going to be not good for you, you know. It's um, it's not good for yourself. It's not good for your family. So there was a whole lot of different factors that I, I and I haven't been shopping for one yet, so I don't know what I'm going to eventually get. But Mark's put um, a Miele, uh stove into his kitchen, um, and it's one that you can just it's just a top, and you can move the pans around to anywhere. There's not like there's a burner, there's another burner, there's another burner. It's a big flat surface, and wherever you put the pot, that's where it goes that puts heat into it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, what I'm making for you today is spaghetti, and the reason I'm doing that is it's it's a really nice simple one um, to to show boiling water, gas, and, and induction. This is this if we put a lid on this, it'll probably boil in about four minutes, but generally it's taking about six minutes to boil three litres of water from cold. If we put hot water into it and we put a lid on it, I reckon we'll probably go three minutes. Um, so it's really efficient. Um, I'm doing spaghettini because it's nice thin stuff and it cooks in sort of four or five minutes. So it's you want dinner in a hurry, this is a really good one. And this is kind of like your classic, classic noosa dish where 
you know, most of the restaurants in Noosa at some point have had a crack at this dish and it's become part of their signature thing. I was at Ricky Ricardo's as the head chef there for about six years, many years ago, and this was kind of like your classic staffies dish. Because, you know, there was always, you always did, you had staff meals for 20 people at lunchtime, staff meals for 20 people at dinner time, and some poor, whoever, whatever poor chef was on staffies for that day had to come up with something. And the one thing we always had was like all the fish off cuts from portioning up all the fish, and spaghettini is cheap and it's quick to cook. So that was like the classic staff meal. For, you know, probably 50% of the time it was like, oh, spaghettini and rocket salad again, yay. Um, but it's a really satisfying dish and it can be, I've got diced barramundi, but really it could be um, prawns or crab or whatever seafood you have, or chicken, or whatever, really. It doesn't really matter. Um, but it's based on the like the idea of um, like an aglio olio sort of pasta, where you have, which is basically oil and garlic. So that's the, the most important thing: using good garlic, using good oil, and the olive oil becomes the flavour, you know, the sauce almost. Um, one thing I do really love about these, and these are just El Cheapo ones that the college owns. So I borrowed these for today. I think they're 120 bucks each um, and if you want to you know have an idea of whether you yeah. whether you like it or not whether it's something that you would like to have in your home then the library has a couple that you can actually go and borrow them like a book and take one home <laughs> it's not as good a reading but it's um, <laughs> it's handy to have you know to have a try one first and you see if you like it these ones are really easy to use you turn it on you select your your wattage but also the temperature so there's like two settings on it, and I've just got them both on absolute full bore at the moment. And it just heats up so, so fast. Um, I guess the, the difference between this and the efficiency of it, energy-wise, everything else, and the gas stove, is that there's direct heat. There's that, there's a big gap, gap of air between that and the, and the heat, whereas this, there's nothing that's straight onto it. So I'm just putting shallots and garlic and chilli to start off with. Mm, yeah, it's a good smell. That's like walking down Hastings Street, that's the main <laughs> smell you smell, isn't it? Yeah. This is one thing I don't like about industrial stoves. You pick it up and then it goes off and you put it back down. But one, you know, you know, like I say, in the old days of going to people's houses and cooking on induction stoves, and that's kind of what put me off them for such a long time, where you, you accidentally leave it, put it in their eyes, turn itself off again, or, you know, whatever. These days are so much different. They're so efficient. Um, they're so easy to use. Um, and I'd take that off, lift it up, and put it back down and it goes back on again. So it's not like it's a bad thing. I think the, the most important thing for me is just getting used to using them, you know, and it just it would take a few months of that change over from being used to gas to going, oh yeah, great, induction's awesome, it's, it's so much faster. Um, so I've just tossed some barramundi, um, got the spaghettini, like I say, I did the experiment last night with my six-year-old daughter where we put the two pots on at the same time and we boiled them in. I think it was about, I have a commercial um, kitchen, uh, like a food van, and I've got a, a couple of gas burners in that. Um, and we put both on, we put this on, and we put one of those on. And yeah, it was so much difference in the, in the speed and everything else. Um, There. Okay, things with cooking cooking pasta, you really want the water to almost be like sea water, so it should be quite salty. That's going to bring the flavour out in the pasta heaps. And then when you cook spaghetti, you never ever break it in half. My mum always used to break it in half. It's like the most evil thing that you can possibly do. <laughs> Make an Italian nonna cry. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you don't need any olive oil in the water. That's another Australian, you know, fallacy, basically. Um, really just a waste of olive oil. Chuck it in there, stir around. I'm glad you see that. Yeah. Uh, he does that. What's that, olive oil? <laughs> olive oil in the water? Yeah, no. Nah. Well, I had this discussion recently. It was, where was I? Uh, I was at it, uh, I was up at Maribara a couple of weeks ago for their food festival. And there was a guy there who was like a chef, but also a bit of a food nerd scientist guy. And yeah, he was saying, yeah, it's really unnecessary. The only thing it does do is maybe break the surf that, um, surface tension. Um, but really, all you're doing is drying it out when you give it down the sink. So I've got some baby capers in there, some diced tomato. And fish, fish doesn't take very long to cook. Um, very controversial ingredient I'm going to put in here is um, some, a little bit of Parmesan cheese. Um, in, in Italians, never, you never put Parmesan cheese in with seafood. It's like, as evil as breaking your spaghetti in half. But I really like it in this because it actually gives the, the, the olive oil, some of the pasta water and the parmesan, it gives you like a sauce that, that the parmesan is almost like the thickener. Um, so flat parsley. And then I'll just throw that parmesan through here. And for years and years, I, I, I was like, no, nah, never, you never put parmesan in pasta. But I've always liked it into seafood stuff. I've always liked just a little sprinkling of it. It kind of gives it umami, which is that, you know, deliciousness. Um, and recently I was watching a, some cooking show and I was talking to this old Italian guy. And they asked him, they said, oh, you know, um, what do you think about putting parmesan into, into seafood dish? And he's like, well, it tastes good. Why not? <laughs> you know, sweet. You just sold it to me. Um, so the other thing we don't want to do, all this beautiful um, pasta water here is all like starchy from the spaghetti to cook dinner. So we don't want to, when this is cooked, run it under the cold tap, which is what my mum did as well. Break it in half, probably put olive oil on top. And um, and then run it under, put it into a colander, and run it under cold water. So, in a restaurant situation, um, if we're cooking three kilos of pasta, you would put a, put a big pot of water on. You throw your um, your pasta in there with your salt and everything else, and then you put a timer on and you tr taste it, try it, and then when it's ready, you tip it into a colander. And then normally what you do is glad wrap the entire bench and then toss it with some olive oil and just spread it all out. And that cools it down really, really fast. The coldness of the bench cools it down. And that means you, you're not rinsing all that beautiful starchiness off it. Um, but you also don't want it to overcook by staying hot. So there's kind of like this, you know, in between thing of, you know, just lay it all out. You can put it on just a big tray or whatever cool it all down nice and quickly, put a bit of olive oil onto it at that point so that it doesn't all stick together. Um, how's that water going over there? No, Nikki, right. do you want to have a look at that water and tell us what, give us an update? We'll have eaten this and washed up and gone home by the time that thing boils over there. <laughs> There's bubbles, is there? Whatever gas. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll wait, we'll wait for that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is kind of the versatility of using this as a really nice heat control as well. So turning this on again and I'll turn it down to the absolute lowest wattage it'll go to, which is 500. And then turn the temperature down to really low. 60. And then I've got some Kovacci chocolate. So this is just a good 70% chocolate, um, the good gear, not compound chocolate. And instead of putting it in a double boiler over the stove, you can pretty much put it straight in there. It doesn't burn. And that's, you know, to me, that wouldn't be a selling point for me. And you can see, like, it's already melting. I'll just put it on just there. 
Um, it doesn't take very much to melt chocolate, basically. So it won't burn on No. Oh. Well, I mean, it will if you turn it on full. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the good thing. You've got, this is like 80 degrees, but with the lowest wattage setting. So there's kind of two buttons on here that you press. You have it on full wattage and full temperature, or you have it on low, you know, you can set those, those things. Um, and you know, this wouldn't be a selling point for me. I wouldn't go, oh, wow, fantastic. I melt chocolate on the stove directly, because you could always put a bowl over a pot of water and melt chocolate. It's, you wouldn't go spending thousands of dollars, but it is a good example, I thought, of how you can have that, um, that perfect heat control where you can, you know, if you wanted to only get to 60 degrees, then you can set it for that. And then you've got, that's what you've got, so. And what I'm doing here is I've kind of just held back a little bit of the chocolate here. So get this melted so that it's, you know, warm, above warm, and then add that cold chocolate to it. And if you're using coverture chocolate, you'll get like a tempering sort of state. So when you temper, um, over to chocolate, you bring it up to like 45 degrees and then you crash it down to 30 or whatever it is, I don't know the temperatures in my head, um, but what that does is that it's called tempering and then that's when you get that really nice crack of the chocolate and the shininess. That and then this is kind of the most simplest way of tempering chocolate is to cool it down by adding more chocolate to it. Not, we talked about that the other day, it's not the most efficient way to use those, but it's kind of like a, a trivet that creates that magnetism. Mark might actually be able to explain to us exactly what's happening with the, the induction. Yeah, yeah. So, so the way an induction cook dot works is it's, uh, it's using magnetic fields, and that's why you need to have a line in your pot. And, uh, and so what this does is it creates a magnetic field, and that magnetic field creates heat in the pot. So. Unlike the gas stove, where the heat is just everywhere and the heat's going around the pot and in your kitchen and all this, the heat is being directly transferred from, from the cooktop into the pot. And so it's a direct heat transfer which makes it a lot more efficient. Um, as Matt mentioned earlier, Council have some of these that you can, uh, that you can, that you can rent. Uh, but they also have some magnets in their in their in their little uh, uh, home electrification kit. So if you go to council, if you if you if you sign out the uh, the cooktop, you get the magnets, so you can check your own yes, pods yeah, and see what's see what's working. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so this is a, this is sort of showing you a really good example of. So I've just turned that on. Turn it up to full bore and hear it. So that's how instant it is. Because that's why I love that about it. I want that to be really hot again now. Take that straight out. And that is the official way that you test your spaghetti. Especially if you've got children, it's the best way. It's the most funnest part of making spaghetti. You get to chuck it at the wall to see if it's ready or not. Just got to remember to take it off the wall before you leave the cooking school. <laughs> Otherwise, they might get upset. Okay. So that little bit of honey through there, and then to get it a little bit more saucy, just some of that pasta water. It's all starchy and delicious. It becomes kind of part of the sauce. nice satisfying one and it can be 
you know, this, this pasta dish itself can be as simple as ali olio, which is garlic and oil. So you fry garlic in olive oil, you throw your pasta through it, and you add a little bit of parmesan. And it's like the really perfect steam. What you want is good olive oil, good, good garlic, the most important, really important things. Australian olive oil is, um, is probably one of the best olive oils in the whole world. It's become really stupidly expensive though because there's a world shortage on olive oil. So that was 20 bucks, I think. Probably would have been about 12 bucks about six months ago. Um, so they've certainly, you know, taken advantage of the fact that there's not enough of it around. But it's selling out in the supermarkets too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, How's so that compared with the copper oil? Cobram is awesome as well. And Cobram is $25, I just noticed. That same size, that was 20, Pendleton. Cobram is 25. But to me, it's, yeah, Cobram, I think, is a fantastic product. Really good oil. Um, and, you know, I think probably the main message with that is that olive oil isn't like wine. It doesn't get better with age. It gets worse with age. So the fresher your oil is, the better it's gonna taste. So in this, it's the sauce, right? It's the flavor of the whole pasta. So if you're using shitty old olive oil that's been sitting in a shipping container on the Spanish docks for the last three years in the heat, then it's not going to be good. It loses its flavour from the moment it comes out of the olive, basically. So if you want good olive oil, then you buy an Australian one. And usually it's got actually written on the bottles of these when it was pressed. Um, I know that uh, Cobram does that. It says that you know, it was pressed on this particular day, 2023 harvest. What's that? Oh, I don't know that they do have that, actually. No, I don't know. But I think it has to be, I think, 6% to be considered extra virgin olive oil, I think it is. We went to Bruce and Italy recently, and Bruce are very particular about that oil, and it was done with super rate 0.1 to 0.5% anything above 0.5% is cosmetics. Yeah, is that right? So, um, so the gas. Boiling, now. okay, so excellent. Oh, out the back. Too late gas, it is ready. We can turn that off now. <coughs> okay, Nikki, do you want to take over, take over on doing this? Like, so, turn that off. And this is another thing, well, that's cold already. So, it's amazing how, you know, it's not wasting any power by... Um, so, for the chocolate, we can see how glossy it is. Just tempering it, and this is a good chocolate. You know, this is uh, Calibo um, Overture, which is if you've ever been to the Noosa Chocolate Factory over at uh, Noosaville, this is the chocolate that they use. Um, it's a good sort of belt, I think it's Belgian chocolate. Um, but uh, you know, if you want to get some good Coverture to use at home, probably the easiest one to get hold of just the supermarket is the Lint box, and you can, you can it'll tell you what percentage of chocolate and cocoa it is on the packet. So you can buy a 70% or a 90% or a 54% or whatever. Um, but I find this is a really nice one. It's kind of like a bit of, we call this a bit of sweet chocolate. It's still got sugar in it, so it's a sweet thing, but it's still, it's mostly cocoa. So it's got bitterness to it as well. And I just made some little profiteroles here and filled them with chocolate custard. So you're going to get to go and eat soon, but what we'll do is we'll plate these up. You guys can go next door and talk, have a chat to Mark, ask him whatever questions you've got for him. You guys got any questions for me? Um, with the different olive oils out on the market, so you've got light, robust. Yep. What's the best one to cook with? Gee, which is I always just go for robust. robust. I'm like, why would you want anything but robust? Like, yeah. I mean, to me, I'm like, yeah, I want as full flavour as possible. I don't think, from a cooking point of view, I don't think it really matter. It's a bit of a personal taste. But generally what it is, is the way that they make it robust or, you know, mild or whatever, is the, generally the combination of olives that they use. So you've got something like a, a Frantoia or a Coroniki olive, then they're really pungent, strong, grassy, and make you almost cough when you eat them. Because they're peppery and like they're full on their heavies, you back your throat. 
Um, but to me, that's like, oh, I love that. You know? And uh, whenever anyone gives me a bottle of olive oil, I meet olive oil producers and people all the time. They're like, oh, yeah, try my olive oil. And the first thing I do is like, just pour some in my hand and eat it. It's just to try it. But it's so delicious to me. It's like, it is, it's a sauce. Um, it's not just a cooking medium like canola. Um, it's just horrible. Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Always. Um, but yeah, it's. I think it comes down to personal taste, trying a few of them and just seeing which one you like. Some, I'm sure that some of them probably are too strong for some people. But I'll always, you know, if I've got the choice, I'll always go a nice robust one. If you make a shit sauce or something like that, do you use oil or butter? Yeah, butter or the thing about olive oil is it, it is strong, so you know you wouldn't make aioli out of olive oil. So it'd just be like green and really hideous looking and bitter. Um, but in something like this pasta, it's just perfect. Or maybe use the lighter olive oil for that. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah. So for the olive oil too hot, is it too sensitive to the heating? Yeah, look. It's a real contentious thing, you know, it, it's a little bit like the rules change on that sort of stuff all the time. Like, how do you cook the best steak? Oh, you never turn it over, you turn it once. Oh no, you turn it 50,000 times while it's cooking. Like, what are you supposed to believe? It really comes down to what, you know, um, what works for you. But I've got no problem with frying with olive oil. The only thing is it does tend to, by heating it, does tend to lose some of its flavor. It doesn't lose all of its flavor. So to me, it's like, you know, um, if I'm doing something like this, then yeah, you're heating the olive oil up and you're going to maybe lose 20% of the flavour of it maybe, but it's still, most of it's there, it's delicious, so um, to me, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with, with cooking with it. And I've spoken to a lot of olive oil people over the years and they're like, yeah, because there's always that, oh no, you don't fry an olive oil because it doesn't have a high burning point or whatever, it's like, nah, just fry with it if that's what you like. What's that there? The brand of the, um, the production. The, um, oh, these ones, these are called Cater Light. And I believe they're just from like one of the cookware, you know, commercial cookware shops like Nesbitt's or whatever. I think they're down at sort of Kiwana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can just drop in there and get them on. I think um, these belong to the college. And I think that Steve said they paid 120 bucks each for them or something. So that's pretty good value. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, if people would like to come into the dining room, uh, we'll bring the food out and we'll also have a bit of a chat around uh, the rewiring. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.